I can't help but notice that a lot of the PC manufacturers seem to be going through this renaissance kind of moment where they're rebranding a lot of their common models, I guess, as a new year, new me kind of thing. Anyway, the point is that Dell did it and now HP is doing it with their Omnibook series of laptops. So the Omnibook 5 that we're reviewing today is kind of the successor of HP's Pavilion series of laptops. And I say kind of because HP has been pretty shy about the marketing around that. Nonetheless, this configuration is rocking some of the latest hardware, including AMD's Ryzen AI5 processor. AMD's Radeon 840M integrated graphics, 16 gigabytes of LP DDR5X memory. We've also got a 512 gigabyte SSD, Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth version 5.4. And yes, this is a 16 inch display with a full HD plus resolution. Now keep in mind, this laptop does come in a ton of configurations, both by AMD and Intel. So there will be some variations depending on the model you own or are planning on getting, but there should be a lot of common things that this review should set as a baseline line, so let's get into it. In terms of packaging, things are pretty standard here. You get a cardboard box, of course, open that up and behind some more protective packaging, here it is, the Omnibook 5 in the flesh. Now we'll get more to that in just a minute. You also have a 65 watt adapter and this is kind of chunky for 2025 standards. I mean, I was expecting a charging brick, but you do get type C charging out of the box and then you've got the standard wall out there charging cable piece. Despite being called the Omnibook 5, this very much is a HD Pavilion lab laptop basically just renamed. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. You still have the same semi-premium build quality with a metallic exterior and plastic bottom finishing. You also do have that iconic silver color that HP presents with most of their laptops. I'm a big fan of that. And this laptop looks like a conservative reserved general productivity machine as it should. With that said, you will have a weight of about 3.9 pounds, but that is more or less in line for the average 16 inch laptop, but a little bit heavier if you are gonna be commuting daily. Also, it's worth noting, starting with the top side, so like I mentioned, you have a metallic finishing over here. And what I appreciate is the high degree of fingerprint resistance. That's great for someone who has OCD like me. And of course, you have that reflective HP logo here that again, we've seen with the Pavilion series in the past. You get a pretty standard set of ports that I think are sufficient for a device like this. So on one side, you have a USB-A super speed port, you have a HDMI 2.1 port, and then you have two Type-C ports with power delivery and display port version 2.1 functionality. Unfortunately, you do not get Thunderbolt standards over here. On the other side, you will get one more USB-A super speed port and a headphone jack. Honestly, the only thing really missing here is a SD card reader or a media card reader in general, but that's being a little nitpicky with a laptop like this, so can't complain. The bottom side, pretty standard stuff again. You have a plastic lid over here. Ironically, despite being called a laptop, since the vents are located directly on the bottom, do not use this on your laps. You'll also notice you do have two speaker grills, one on either corner, indicating this is a bottom firing speaker setup. Yes, we'll do a sound test later on. Unfolding this laptop presents you with a metallic inner chassis. The silver color definitely goes nice over here. You've got plenty of palm rest space and a nice large trackpad with plenty of surf real estate at the center. It is a plastic surface finish, so there is going to be some degree of flex, but all things considered, it's pretty contained. There is a degree of tactility, and it's actually not a bad trackpad. The keyboard here, again, a copy and paste literally of the pavilion style keyboard we're used to. So you've got those square keycaps with a gray finishing. You've got plenty of surface area per keycap. The font is easy to read. You have a fully backlit system that's standard across the entire series. And then yes, you do also have a 10 keypad with the 16 inch variant here, though you don't get a built-in fingerprint reader. As far as the typing quality is concerned, it's not the best in class, but you get a decent amount of tactility. There's not a lot of flex on the keyboard itself. So again, it's a respectable typing experience. Directly above the keyboard, I can see that HP continues to have that weird fetish of poking a bunch of holes that are not actually speaker grills, nor are they cooling vents. They're just kind of an HP thing. Anyway, what is questionable here is the hinge quality. It has a ton of wobble. It exerts a ton of force on the main chassis, and it might have potential long-term implications if you're not careful with it. You also do have a plastic encasing around the display, which is pretty standard for this class again. And then you will notice you have a bit of a noticeable chin at the bottom, but it's not too dramatic either. Then you have relatively thin bezels on the side, providing for an immersive experience. And at the top, you have a somewhat noticeable forehead, but it's not the fattest I've seen in this class category. And at the center, you do have a full HD webcam, which is actually pretty decent in terms of its light capture as well as general image quality. 
The display is a little bit more on the disappointing side. So, I mean, you get a 16 inch IPS panel, which is nice. You have a full HD plus resolution, which is fair game. And that means you do get a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. You do unfortunately only have a 60 Hertz based refresh rate. And to make matters worse, you have a peak brightness of just 300 nits. And that is frankly way too low for any sort of well-lit room or outdoor setting. So it is definitely, like I said, a disappointment. And with this display, you don't get touch captivity, though there is a touch model available. As far as color rating is concerned, you get a disappointing 62% sRGB rating, which is insufficient for most color sensitive activities like video editing or photo editing, or even just enjoying high quality the colors when watching multimedia on your laptop. A quick recap of the technical specifications on board. So we do have AMD's Ryzen AI5 340 processor, which also means we do get AMD's Radeon 840M integrated graphics paired with it and 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5X memory. Depending on where you are, you can spec for a more powerful AI7 variant with a more powerful 860M Radeon integrated iGPU and up to 32 gigabytes of LPDDR5X memory. And again, depending on where you are, you may also be able to get this device with an Intel Core Ultra specification instead. This processor is more than sufficient for general productivity like surfing the web or watching videos online. Of course, doing more demanding activities like programming and code compilation, again, you have enough memory, enough horsepower to have a pretty smooth experience. Now, when you start doing more intensive things like Blender, for example, the 840M can definitely hold its ground. However, you are going to notice that things start getting a little choppy if you add too many elements. Admittedly, Intel's Arc graphics do a better job of holding up in these kind of applications. Now, when you do the most intensive stuff like 4K video editing. It is definitely possible here. I mean, you're able to stack up multiple layers before you notice visible frame drops. But I will again say that Intel's core ultra processors with their integrated art graphics actually do a better job of stacking up these applications with a smoother experience overall, but it's not bad over here. And you can always get a little bit more power with the Ryzen AI7 variant and render speeds are also decent. Now, as far as gaming is concerned, you can definitely get some pretty impressive results games like Counter-Strike 2 Go when plugged in, you will definitely find you can hit 60 FPS at the native resolution with relatively high settings across the board, which again provides for a pretty smooth casual gaming experience. Thermals on this device are genuinely impressive and HP has definitely come a long way. So with the unrealistic peak load, we've hit a maximum average surface temperature, just a little over 38 degrees Celsius with a much more realistic sustained load hovering around 35 degrees Celsius, which again is a very cool and reasonable number. Now, as far as fan noise is concerned, the good news is that the fan rarely goes off or shall I say on when you're actually doing general productivity. It isn't until you start really pushing this laptop, you start hitting peak levels of noise and that barely touches 40 decibels in itself, which is actually one of the more quieter laptops in this class category. The days of self upgrade are mostly gone. Fortunately, you can still replace the existing M.2 drive with another 2280 drive over here if you so wish. RAM and connectivity modules are entirely soldered on board. You do get a rather small 59 watt hour battery. And despite the efficiencies of the AI5 processor, you can realistically expect a runtime just around nine hours with a general productivity use case. As far as sound quality is concerned, you basically got a bottom firing speaker system. You do get a fair bit of volume, but there's not gonna be a lot of depth over here. Here's a quick sound test for reference. The configuration we reviewed today has a price point of approximately 1,020 US dollars. And look, I'll be honest, this is a mid-range laptop with a upper mid-range laptop price, or at least that would have been the case in like 2022, 2023. Laptop prices have have just become a lot more expensive due to general consumerism slash greed slash tariffs slash demand, whatever you want to call it. The fact is though, even when you compare the Omnibook 5 relative to other competitors, it is priced where you'll find most other competitors in the same class category. And in that capacity, the Omnibook 5 is actually one of the better offerings out there. Firstly, it's got a respectable build quality. HP hasn't really cheaped out on anything in particular. For example, Dell with their new uh, Dell Plus laptops, the keyboard quality on that 
is really bad. I did a review on that machine and seriously, I mean, you can tell that they've definitely done budget cuts while still keeping the same price. But over here, we don't have those kind of problems. The biggest downfall just left on my opinion is its display quality, which honestly should have been at least a 90 hertz display with at least 400 nits of brightness. But other than that, this laptop seems to do well in the performance department. I would, however, recommend getting the Core Ultra variant if you are gonna be doing video editing or photo editing device, as it seems like those variants are a little bit more better optimized with those kind of applications. But for everything else, this is a very respectable laptop. Waited out a little bit longer and around back to school season, this thing usually goes on sale. You might expect savings as much as 20% potentially. So again, keep an eye out for that. And let me know what you think of the HP Omnibook 5. And if you already have it, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. As always, if you enjoyed the content, make sure you hit that like when it's up to our channel because it's my bread and butter and it means the world to me. Thank you so much for watching. Catch you in the next one.